you here today. Thanks for sharing your Saturday with me um, again. Um, and I'm excited to talk, you, to talk to you about why um, I'm over the moon with, with carbon nanotubes. Now, do you guys know that phrase? I thought I was being really clever because it has two meanings here. Over the moon means very excited. So, okay, so I'm very excited about nanotubes. <laughs> but there's actually a moon relevant. There's a moon connection as well. So it's a, it's a clever multiple meaning title, just so you know that. <laughs> and you can't see it, but there's our nanotubes on there. Great. So, so maybe, who here has heard of nanotubes before? Thought about them? Yeah. And also, feel free to ask me questions during the talk. I don't want this to be incredibly formal or anything like that. Um, yeah, probably many of you have heard of nanotubes, heard of nanotechnology. Maybe you've seen some of the press. There's a lot of press on these things, right? And the press is, is, is pretty amazing, right? You see nano find success in treating cancer, and nanotubes make tough fibers, and you can make silicon transistors. Very recently, someone found that you can make material that bounces bullets made of nanotubes, nanotube displays. And my favorite headline is, will nanotech save the world, or is it mostly hype? <laughs> right? So there's a lot of, there's a lot of thing, words spreading around about nanotubes and nanotechnology. And you, know, you may have seen these headlines, but wondered, you know, what, what is this about? Is this, is, is this really something that's going to revolutionize the future, or is it just a bunch of people blowing steam, right? What's, what's really going on here? And so that's what I want to talk about today. First, is, is the hype true about these little molecules we'll talk about? What's it all about, and, and why should you care? And so I think my answers are, the, the hype may be true. <laughs> it's hedging a little bit, but maybe. And I'll show you some of the things that can be done with nanotubes and why they are somewhat very promising for the future. And here's a display that's made of carbon nanotubes a few years ago. What's it all about? This is going to be the bulk of the talk today, about the synthesis properties, science, and applications of nanotubes. You can see one here. There's just these long, thin wires, and we'll talk a lot about how we make these and how we can study them. And then why should you care? Well, because the hype may be true, right? This is something that could really affect you in the future, that could really change the way that you interact with the world, right? Here's a picture of someone holding, you can, bar can anyone, you can barely see between his fingers, he's holding a nanotube fiber. So this really could change technology of the future. On top of that, I think that nanotubes in general are just a very good example of nanotechnology research. So even if you don't think you want to look at, think about nanotubes so much, any element of nanotechnology, you can think about in very much the same terms that I'll talk about nanotubes today. So if you think you want to study DNA or interested in small you know, in small spherical molecules. You know, a lot of the things and techniques I'll talk about today are applicable to many other nanotechnology systems. And finally, as I said, I just think nanotubes are cool. So <laughs> that's a great reason for studying things, I think. <laughs> so all of these things. So I'll start this talk by talking in general about what nano is and then what the general properties of nanotubes are, how we grow them, and then go on to the science and applications. Um, start by talking about just mechanical properties, composites, fibers, a space elevator, uh, displays and chemical sensing, and then talk more extensively about nanoelectronics, partly because that's what I research in particular, and also because there's, that's where a lot of physics is, um, in nano circuit, and then what I'll talk about is quantum electronics. Okay, so, so what, is, what is a nano? What's a nanometer? A nanometer is, is a billionth of a meter, 10 to the minus 9 meters, right? Um, you can imagine taking this meter stick, okay, and then shrinking it down by a factor of 1,000. Okay, and you get this pinhead. Can you, see the, can you guys see the pinhead? Okay, shrink this meter stick to, by a factor of 1,000, you get the pinhead. Shrink this pinhead by a factor of 1,000, and then shrink it by a factor of 1,000 again, and you get a nanometer. Okay, so very, very, very small. A few atoms across, the size of DNA, right? And uh, there's a great video I encourage you to look at. It's called Powers of 10. I'm, I won't show it now, but you can see here but if we, there's, it's, it just zooms in as you go smaller and smaller to show you what happens at different length scales. And you can see if we start at about a meter, here's a man lying on a blanket, right? That sort of person size, zoom in to about 10 centimeters. You can see his hand, zoom in to 10 to the minus 2 meters. You can see the skin on his hand, 10 to the minus 3, a millimeter. You can see cracks on his skin. 10 to the minus 4, the crack becomes membrane. 10 to the minus 5, a lymphocyte, minus 6 into the membrane of the lymph lymphocyte. 10 to the minus 7, 100 nanometers, you can start seeing DNA. 10 to the minus 8, you can really start differentiating almost the atoms in DNA. And by 10 to the minus 9, by a nanometer, you can see individual atoms. These are carbon and hydrogen atoms in the DNA itself. Okay. So this is what we're talking about. We're scaling from sort of meter size, what, you, what you're used to seeing, to practically DNA size. You're getting close to individual atoms. 
Okay? And the question is, what new things can you study at this length scale? And what's the, what's the interesting physics and applications in, in working at, this, at these really small sizes? Okay, so here I've given you just a, you know, as I said, nanotubes are, are sort of an example of nanotechnology research. I've given a, a sort of mumbo jumbo, I think I even stole this off Wikipedia definition of nanotechnology. But basically nanotechnology is just studying small things and trying to use them, okay? It's just studying, studying things on about the nanometer length scale, let's say from about one nanometer to a thousand nanometers. Studying things at those small length scales and then trying to do things with them, okay? That's basically nanotechnology. Okay. And I should mention that the reason nanotechnology is so big these days is because, um, for one, there's, there's a lot of motivation to make things smaller, like your computer chips, right? People want to make things smaller and smaller down to the nanoscale. And in addition, there's been a lot of new technology that's enabled research on this scale, and I'll say a little bit more about that later. So a lot of new technologies have made these studies possible. And nanotechnology encompasses research in a lot of different fields, in, in, conden in physics, in engineering, in biology, material science, basic and applied science. Um, examples are, are nanotubes and nanowires, DNA research, nanorobots, quantum devices, nanopowders. If you just look at paint these days, paint is made with, with particles that are of the nanometer length scale, right? So already just additives in materials commonly used are already nanometer size, and so that's sort of nanotechnology. And here's an example of a little nano robot made of atoms that's presumably going and getting you your lunch or something, really small pieces of your lunch. And, uh, and these, are, these are little you know, nano robot drugs that are presumably coursing through your blood screen, getting directly to the cancer and just attacking it and then leaving again, right? So these are sort of the potential of nanotech, of, 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 of really going, into, go, going non-invasively into small spaces and, and really, uh, really, uh, focusing on, on certain, on certain uh, diseases or certain, certain tasks that you couldn't do with bigger scale things. Okay, so as I said, I'm gonna argue that nanotubes are a highlight of nanotechnology. Okay, so, so, so what are nanotubes, carbon nanotubes? Well, in 1991, Sumio Ajima in, in Japan um, put together two pieces of metal and sparked them. So he took two pieces of graphite, graphite is made of carbon. One of the pieces of graphite, pieces of graphite had some iron in it. He put a voltage across these guys, and they sparked. Okay, so let's see over here. Let's see, do I want all lights on for this? Yeah, okay. Let's see over here what this looks like. Okay, so over here I just have something similar to what Ijima did. As I said, he took two pieces of metal, carbon metal, right, and sparked them together. Here I have two pieces of metal, it's a capacitor. I'm gonna put a high voltage across them and then just spark them and see what happens to it. So here's some lead tin metal and I'll just cross these electrodes at high potential and it sparks. And you can look at the camera up there, and you can see that there's some grooves in it, but it's sort of clean before I do this. But after I spark it a few times, you can see that there are little spots left on here. Okay, see that little spot there? Take that off. Okay, so there are little spots left on there, and in fact, if I take a tissue, which Let's find a clean spot on here and just wipe it on here now. Okay. Maybe you can see the tissue is sort of, sort of is black. Can anyone see that? I got some metal soot on there. So that's basically what this guy did. He sparked his graphite and he got some soot on the leads, right? Except I call it a very special sort of soot. Because when he looked at this soot under a microscope, he saw there was actually little tub tubules. Okay, so he just looked at this carbon soot, and instead of just being over here, this is probably just little, little particles, little shards of tin or, India or, or lead that we saw over here. When he looked at his carbon soot, he found these tubules, and he called them nanotubes. Okay. So nanotubes are just tubules of carbon. Okay, if you look at them, if you just look at them in bulk, they look like soot. 
right? But if you look at that silk under at very, very small scales under a microscope, they look like tubes, like this, okay? Where at the vertex of each of these hexagons is a carbon atom, okay? See, so at every point here is a carbon atom, and this is just a carbon tube, okay? And you can see the carbon tubes are actually capped, and uh, if you look at them again under a very small microscope, they look like that. So in a sense, nanotubes are just another form of carbon. Okay, you have things like, like diamond. These are carbon atoms in this form for diamond. Okay. You have graphite, where instead of having a crystal form, you have sheets of carbon. Okay. Graphite. You can have buckyballs, where you have these soccer ball-shaped things of carbon. Buckyballs. Or you can have nanotubes, where you have tubular shapes of carbon. Now, I said, I put just in parentheses, I said just another form of carbon because actually these other forms of carbon are incredibly useful, right? If you think about it, right, diamond is one of the hardest substances known. It's used for all sorts of industrial applications and they look really pretty, right? Graphite is, uh, is useful in, you know, things like pencils, right? Buckyballs, not incredibly useful that, but very, very interesting to study. So you could already guess that having a tubular form of carbon really might open up some interesting applications and interesting fields of studies. And, Indeed, when people thought, realized what the nanotube properties were, they have an incredible amount of very, very useful properties just based on their structure and, the fact that, and, the, and their molecular form. So, so what's, what's so great about nanotubes? Well, it turns out that you can take, nanotubes are just a sheet, a sheet of graphite. Here's a sheet of graphite. And I can roll this up to make a nanotube, okay? I can roll it multiple times if I roll it except they don't get stuck as easily. <laughs> I can roll it multiple times. I can roll it, you know, to make one tube. I can make multiple tubes out of this, right? I can roll them really small. You can roll them so small, the diameter across here is less than a nanometer, less than a billionth of a meter naturally occurring, right? That's really amazing to get. You couldn't, you couldn't design that yourself or make it, right? These things just show up as less than a nanometer in diameter, but very, very long length scales. They could be up to four centimeters. Can you think about that, right? Something that you can actually hold in your hand this big, but that's one nanometer across, okay? An amazing aspect ratio, okay? They're lightweight. They're, some, you know, they're hollow, right? So they're pretty lightweight. They're lighter than things like metals like aluminum, right? But they're very strong, okay? They're very strong. And actually, you can think about this over here, except I want to... Right? Why would nanotubes be so strong? Well, here you can see I just have a flat sheet of paper, okay? And if I put a weight on this, the paper just sort of buckles, okay? It's not incredibly strong. But if I take the same piece of paper and roll it up, right? Let's hold it so it doesn't roll. And then put the weight on it, it can hold up the weight. Things that are rolled are often stronger than things that are just flat, right? That just gives you a sense, except I tipped it. It really held it. <laughs> you can, things that are rolled are often stronger than, than, things, than things that are flat. So you can see how nanotubes might be, might be very strong compared to even things like graphite or other materials. Right? So you can make multiple wall tubes. They're small. They're long. They're lightweight. They're strong. They're flexible. They can transmit heat. They're stable at high temperatures. They have large filling and surface areas. Right? There's a big surface area on the outside. You can fill them with stuff. Right? Um, when I say they're flexible, you can see here, you can bend these things like straws and they bounce back even though they're very strong. Okay, they really look like these long wires. Um, they also have amazing electrical properties. They can have different sorts of metallic properties. I'll say more about that later. They carry high currents. You can emit electrons from them. They have very good conduction. And they're really these nice, natural, one-dimensional molecules which are really interesting for studying physics in one dimension. So this is why nanotube properties deserves its own exclamation point, okay? Because they're really amazing. I mean, just just the structure of these tubes alone gives them properties in one little molecule that no other material has. And so because of this, there's just been an explosion in the possible applications of nanotubes. They're useful for tons of different areas of science and technology. Okay, there's, there's applications in, in mechanical things, like making composites or microscope tips or nano tweezers, uh, fibers and sheets. There's applications in chemical sensing and biomedicine application in making displays out of them, a lot of electronics applications from transistors to memories to, uh, to quantum computing. Okay, nanotubes, it turns out, because of the properties I just talked about, 
are useful in all of these different areas, okay, and interesting in all these different areas. So I'm going to start by, by going through some of these, right, to say briefly about mechanical properties and then a little bit about the chemical and electronic and then a lot more about the general electronic properties, just to give you a sense of how you, how you can make things out of nanotubes, what they might be used for and what, why they might be interesting. So first, the mechanical properties of tubes. And, I, and I, by mechanical, I just, mean, I just mean applications in science that are really based on the tube structure rather than necessarily their electronic properties, okay? The mechanical, it's not, nothing's really rigid, everything's really interconnected. But things like fibers are based on the fact that tubes can be long and strong, for example. Okay, so what are some, what are some of the applications? Well, one of the things I mentioned is that you can take a nanotube and just fill it, right? If I take a nanotube and put a molecule inside, right? That molecule, the nanotube is usually capped, that molecule will just stay inside, right? I can take a molecule and just fill the nanotube with molecules, okay? So why is this useful? Well, imagine if these molecules are hydrogen, right? Why do we want to store hydrogen? Anyone want to guess? What's hydrogen useful for, storing hydrogen? Cars, right? There's this big, there's this big motivate, there's this big impetus to make cars running on hydrogen, right? But what's one of the biggest drawbacks? No one really wants a big tank full of hydrogen. It's kind of unstable when it hits oxygen, right? That's not so great. We live in oxygen, right? You don't really want something that's just liquid hydrogen in the back of your car. So what if you could actually store hydrogen in something that's a little bit more inert, in some sort of solid state form, right, that doesn't really explode as easily when it just hits air, right? So there's a big, you can put hydrogen inside nanotubes and get automatically a clean renewable energy source in a solid state form. And people have actually done this. They found that you can trap hydrogen in a in a nanotube molecule, and then when you heat the molecule, right, at, when you cool it at room temperatures, it's like this, you heat it up, all the hydrogen comes out, you can use it for fuel, okay? That, that's pretty, pretty useful and actually could be revolutionary. Um, they've rep it's been reported that n nanotubes have a very high absorption rate. 8% may not seem high, but the Department of Energy says only 6.5% is really necessary for efficient fuel storage, okay? So nanotubes, it seems, have really reached that limit, um, and it's very attractive to have nanotubes instead of these high-pressure tanks and liquid storage. There's still some tech, a lot, well, a lot of technology that needs to be worked out, including the fact that nanotubes tend to absorb a lot of things, not just hydrogen. So people are working on, on um, making sure they're just getting hydrogen stored rather than other molecules. But I think this could be one of the more promising technologies for using things like nanotubes. And again, they require stable molecules that are, that are hollow, right, like this. What else? Nanotubes are also useful for composites. By composites, I mean that you can mix nanotubes with other materials and improve the properties of those materials. Okay, so for example, um, if you want nanotubes to have a high aspect ratio, they're very conductive, they're very strong, they're very flexible. So if you add them to other materials, those other materials also become more conductive, more you know, stronger, and more flexible. Okay, and here's just an example. Here's a graph showing conductivity versus the percent of carbon added, typically people add just what's called carbon black. It's sort of like carbon soot to materials to make them conductive. And you can see you have to add a lot of carbon black to make things conducting, but mu much less nanotubes. This is multi-wall nanotubes. So you can add a smaller fraction of nanotubes and get things more conducting, right? They really have better properties than what's typically used, right? And the uses for these are, are things like um, anti-static shielding, right? I'm um, also making transparent, flexible conductors, right? Everyone wants, not everyone, but many people think it might be useful to have a computer, a computer that just rolls up like paper and fits in your pocket, right? Wouldn't that be sort of nice? I mean, I know, I know your little blackberries and stuff are sort of small, but, you know, they don't really bend right now. If you could roll something up and just put it away somewhere, right, and yet it still acted like a computer, that would really be amazing, right? This is where you get to things like wearable computers. You can make a dress that just has a, you know, circuits on it and stuff, right? Um, transparent is also useful, right? You can, you can, you can, uh, you can have things that, uh, there are many times you want to see through something but also have it conduct or have, have a circuit board on it. And so it turns out because, because you don't need to add a lot of nanotubes to a material to make it conducting, you can have just a very thin layer of nanotubes that stays transparent while keeping a conducting circuit, okay? So it's actually better, you can make thinner layers of nanotubes, they're more flexible and more transparent and even the current technology that's being used. And here's, there's a group here at UIUC, the John Rogers Group of Material Science, who just takes networks of nanotubes, 
puts them on transparent substrates, and then shows that you can make these flexible transparent electronics. You can see one of these over here. Oops, that didn't work. Okay, so here you can actually see under the screen, right, this, you can see, can you see right here, this sort of, it just looks like little squares on here. These little squares are actually little, uh, little circuits, okay, circuits made of, trans of nanotubes, and you can see they're transparent, right, and you can see the same thing here, right, these little squares are actually patterned nanotube circuits that you can see through, right, and if I took this and just held it up, right, here's the same thing here, you can see that it bends. Right? It's totally flexible, totally transparent, and conducting. Very, very useful, right? Imagine having this as your computer screen, and you just rolled it up and put it in your pocket. Okay? You can also take nanotubes and print them on, print entire circuits out of nanotubes. Let's see if you can see this well. Can you see that? Right? This is an entire circuit printed out of nanotubes. Right? You can see that here. You can, it's hard to see in there, but it's a circuit printed with nanotubes in the center. You can't see the tubes. They're too small to see. You have to believe you that the circuit printed with nanotubes. And once again, you can see here that this is just, it's a very thin and conducting substrate. Okay? So very, very useful for these sort of things. Okay. Or if you want to buy something right now, you can always buy the Babolette VS nanotube power racket for $250 if you just have to get your hands on a nanotube, uh, on a nanotube based uh, application, right? So this is showing that it's a natural progression from graphite to titanium to nanotubes. It's just the best available thing, right? So uh, I, I don't know. They, they promise all sorts of things. Uh, I, I, I haven't seen anyone on the, uh, on the, uh, in the professional tour actually using these yet, but... <laughs> But you never know, right? They're, they're commercial already, at, at least for this. Right. And then one of the big things I mentioned is just making fibers out of nanotubes. Here's, these are bunches and bunches of nanotubes just rolled up into a fiber. Okay? And I'll say more how this is made later, but basically they just have a, a furnace where they, they grow nanotubes at high temperatures of the carbon source and then wind it up. As the nanotubes precipitate out of the, out of the furnace, they just spin, you know, sort of like you're doing traditional weaving. They just spin fibers out of this, right? And you, get, you can get different sorts of fibers made of nanotubes. Now, these things are pretty strong. Right now, they're only about half the strength of steel, but steel is incredibly strong, and this is really developing technology. So, so, so far, nanotubes are incredibly strong, right? And in theory, they can be about 40 times stronger than steel, even. So they can be very, very strong, and you can see here that there's someone just holding a fiber made of nanotube. These things are, are really macroscopic. Well, this brings us to one of the more exciting applications of tubes, which is, which is the nanotube space elevator. Has anyone here heard of the nanotube space elevator? Okay, great. This is why we're over the moon with carbon nanotubes. You can use nanotubes to get to the moon, okay? In this case, you can take a very strong nanotube fiber, right, and send it all the way out beyond the Earth's gravitational pull. Now, why would you want to do this? Because generally, if you want to send things into space, you have to take a rocket and load it up with sort of a small amount of stuff and then use all this jet fuel and send it, you know, jetting off into space. And it takes a lot of energy. It's sort of, and it's very inefficient. It's sort of dangerous, right? It's not the best way to get things out to space, especially if you want to have a permanent moon base or if you want to have a permanent space station out there. An easier way of doing it is if you could just have a cable leading out to your space station or leading out to the moon and then take these very efficient electrical ratcheters and just have them slowly use solar power to just ratchet their way up. It'll take them a long time, but it's incredibly efficient and low cost, right? You can use lots of these ratcheters just going up and down to bring stuff to space all the time. Okay, that's a really, that's a really, a very low cost way of uh, sending things into space. So here's an example of a, of a, uh, of a nanotube fiber, and here's a little ratcheter that's just slowly creeping up into space and is eventually going to the space station to deposit, you know, fresh vegetables for the day or something like that, right? So why does this require nanotubes? Well, it turns out that most materials, most materials, if you try to make a very, I mean, this has to be pretty long. We're talking you know, millions of miles, right? So if you try to make a fiber 
that can go up millions of miles, it'll just collapse under its own weight, typically. Right? And you can, you can sort of see this here. This is a, not quite the same, but if I take just a piece of wire, if I make it short, it's sort of rigid. And if I make it a little longer, it starts wobbling a little bit. And if I make it even longer, it just sort of bends over. Okay. Well, this isn't quite fair. It's sort of un this is unstable in gravity, but you can see that as you make things taller, you start having different effects that really make them unstable and make them start to collapse. And if you tried to make a fiber out of steel, for example, you'd have to make it so big, right? It would make, have, be so heavy, it would just collapse under its own weight. That's no good, right? Nanotubes are strong and lightweight. You can only really do this with nanotubes. They're one of the, I think the only material that I know of, they're strong enough right, that, that you can make them relatively thin, right, and they can hold the weight of the ratcheter, and, you know, and, and yet they're lightweight enough, they're not going to collapse under their own weight. So the space elevator really requires nanotubes to work. And uh, I'm not going to go into detail on this, I just, I just think it's sort of cool. There's a website here that I encourage you to look at, if you're interested in the space elevator, this is where I took all these images, it's a really nice description of exactly how it works, okay, but the idea is that you start by putting a fiber out in space and then using a ratcheter to get more and more fibers. You have to think very carefully about the, about the construction of the, of the fiber itself. It has to be thinner at the earth and fatter out here as a counterbalance. It also turns out that if the ratio of the distance of the thickness at earth versus the thickness in space is only about 1.5 for nanotubes, it would have to be something like 10 to the 33 for steel. Right? That tells you why, again, you want to use nanotubes. And they have to worry about all things like like lightning and currents and LEO objects, probably UFOs too, right? <laughs> Everything, anything that could possibly hit you in space you have to worry about, they're, they're worrying about it, right? It's, it's you know, someone else is, is doing the worrying. Um, and in fact, there's a company that's been founded in, in 2003 to actually build this space elevator. It's Liftport. You can go to liftport.com and they've actually started building the space elevator. Well, they started making nanotubes and building the ratcheters and they hope to put it together. And they say that they're, you know, a group founded in 2003 is a group of companies dedicated to building the space elevator. Okay? And so, you know, it's good that someone's doing it. Their countdown to lift is, is they have a countdown on there that's just counting down every day. Their countdown to lift off now is to lift is, uh, is 2031. I have to admit that I, I looked at this site about last maybe two years ago, and at that point their countdown to lift was 2017, which is not very encouraging to me that every two years you have to gain another 15. Right? <laughs> but, uh, but at the same time, I think I, I'm very excited about this because I think it's, it's, it, it's an example of how once you have new materials with new capabilities, you can really start thinking about things you would have never thought of before, right? If you didn't have nanotubes, you'd never think of a space elevator. Now that you have nanotubes, you can really start thinking about how to actually implement this thing. It allows us to think outside the range of what we typically think of, and I think that's a great thing for... For, for science and just for us as, as, as humans. Okay, so I'm going to briefly talk about two, some, a couple other applications before I go on to electronic circuits, just field emitters and chemical applications, just to give you another taste of what else nanotubes are, are used for. Um, one of the big applications that I think might be coming to market relatively soon is using nanotubes as field emitters. This means that if you put a strong electric field across tubes, they emit electrons. Well, why is this useful? If you think about it, you can take a nanotube, emit electrons, and the electrons hit a phosphor, and that's a flat panel display. Okay? So you can make very inexpensive, bright, um, efficient flat panel displays just using nanotubes. Well, so the idea is that you put a strong electric field across something, and they emit electrons. You can actually see that over here. Here I have two sharp, pointy screwdrivers. Are they screwdrivers? No, what are these things? Two sharp, pointy things. <laughs> two sharp, pointy things. I'm going to put a strong electric field across them and see what happens. Okay. Those sparks are actually, I'm actually breaking down the air. I'm passing electrical current between one, between one tip and the others. I'm putting a high voltage across these sharp pointy things and actually passing electrical current through the air. Okay, they're actually emitting electrons, allowing electrons to travel through the air. See that? Now if you notice, we have these sharp pointy things to do this. It turns out you really get a strong effect 
of emitting electrons at a high electric field if things are sharp and pointy. Right? You don't get it if you just have a round glob because then you don't get a high field at one point. You want a tall, you want something with a high aspect ratio that's very narrow to get a very strong field effect. Well, what do we know that has a high aspect ratio and is very narrow? Well, it's our nanotubes, right? This is why they're good for this. Okay, so, so nanotubes have a very high aspect ratio, get a very high field out of them. They're also just very, have a high conductivity. They're good structurally. Here's an example. I, I think that, whatever, this is a, it, the, the picture makes them look a little funny, but this is a, a field of nanotubes shown here. And you can make very nice flat panel displays just using tubes. And in fact, these have been commercialized already. They're, they haven't been old, but they've been made. Um, this is by N Motorola, 2005, made a, uh, I don't know how big this is. What does it say here? A 42 inch, a 42 inch high definition TV using nanotubes. Okay. So they've actually grown this. They've actually made these things already and they work. Okay. So these are one of the things that might actually really work in the future. Um, I think the reason that you haven't really seen these on the market yet, and I think the reason why is actually there've also been a lot of advances in things like liquid crystal displays and other polymers. And as you know, it's really hard to knock off existing technologies, right? Once people have put money into other technologies, it's really hard to replace it with new ones, even if you get like a factor of two improvement. So there's not a lot of motivation to, to change the current technology to LCDs, especially since prices are already going down. But in the future, I think, you know, as you want smaller and smaller displays with higher, you know, with higher quality and cheaper, you're really gonna start moving to things like nanotubes. It, it really works. And then very briefly, another big application of things that are really coming to market right now, being produced, is using nanotubes for things like chemical sensing. Um, in this case, it's just a very simple application. I said you have a pretty high, a pretty big surface on these, and these things conduct, right? So if you, you know, they, now I can measure how they conduct, then I put something on the surface, and it changes the conduction. That's a chemical sensor, okay? So here is an example of wrapping nanotubes with a nerve gas agent. Here's the resistance of the tubes as a function of time. And here as I put the nerve gas agent on, the resistance goes up. I take it off, the resistance goes down, I put it on. So you can see we're sensing the presence of this nerve gas agent. Okay? And, that's, and that's really, really useful. And there's actually already some commercial sensors using nanotubes that are out on the market. And again, nanotubes are, are um, better than some other products out there because they do, they are very small, right? These are very good out in the field. You can have very, very small sensors that are very, very sensitive right, that, um, that, uh, that have a very strong response, okay, and a big surface area for the strong response. And then just a last example, one of my favorite applications, this is someone at the Strano Group at Illinois developed, it's a nanotube-based glucose sensor, and here they just take nanotubes, they, they coat them with glucose-sensitive chemicals, okay, they then put them in your skin, this is just sitting, you can see one of these capillaries filled with nanotubes that have glucose-sensitive chemicals on them. You can insert this into your skin, and then it turns out that if you illuminate the nanotubes with a laser, the amount of, 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 um, the amount of fluorescence you get, these things fluoresce a little bit, the amount of fluorescence you get will depend on how much glucose is in your bloodstream. Right? So you don't have to prick your finger anymore if you're diabetic. Right? You can just shine a laser on your skin, have a little detector, and figure out what your glucose levels are. Okay? That's really, really good as a technology for people who don't want to use needles and things like that. And so this, this really seems to work, and I think, they're, I think they're probably trying to commercialize this now. So these are the sort of directions that you can go um, by just using the structure and properties of tubes to make different sorts of, um, different sorts of sensors and detectors. Okay. I'm going to spend the rest of the talk, which is, I don't know, a few more minutes, <laughs> talking about electronics of nanotubes. And I've, I've put little dashed lines to the displays and the chemical scent properties because, as you could probably tell, the chemical properties depended on the electronic properties of tubes and the displays depend on the electronic properties of tubes. But tubes are really, you can think of them, as I said, as just long wires, right? What can we do when we think about nanotubes? as just wires, right? Not trying to add something to them or mix them up with stuff, but just measure them as long, thin wires. How are they useful to us? How are they interesting to us? And in this case, there's a, a huge world of things that you want to use small wires for, like I said, for transistors, for memory, for things called quantum electronics, which I'll also mention. 
Okay. So in this case, one of the more interesting electrical things about nanotubes is that their electrical properties depend on, they depend on their, uh, let me unroll it, they're, they're sheets of graphite. So the electrical properties depend on the properties of graphite, first of all, right? Graphite conducts, okay, it's a pretty, it's a, it's a semi, it's a, me, it's a half metal, it conducts okay. But then depending on how you roll up this graphite will determine the metallic properties of nanotubes. So for example, if I roll the graphite this way, I get a metallic tube. If I roll the graphite at some random angle, I might get a tube that's not metallic. That's what we call semiconducting, okay? That's not as good a conductor, but has tunable conduction properties, okay? So depending on how I roll the tube, I can get different metallic properties. Actually, this is really cool. I mean, if you, if you think about it, right, if I just take any other material, doing that. i try that again. If I just take any random material, let's say I take a piece of copper, right? This copper is a metal, so it should conduct, okay? So I can put on, I can just take an ohm meter. Has anyone, everyone here used an ohm meter before? Who's used an ohm meter? This just measures the resistance. It basically puts a current across some, puts a voltage across something and measures the current. Okay, it puts a current across something and measures the voltage, then voltage is proportional to the current by the resistance, right? So things that have a lower resistance are more conducting, a higher resistance are less conducting. So I can take this piece of metal, just a piece of copper, I can put my leads across it like this, and I can measure the resistance you can see it on the screen up there. I guess something pretty low. It's something like 0.2 ohms. That's a pretty low resistance. It means this metal is very conducting. Okay. Then I can take another piece of something like a piece of wood, and I can measure the resistance of this. I can get on my probes. Right. And it says it's overloaded at the mega ohm range. And so I have a very, very high resistance for my piece of wood. Okay. And then I can take a piece of graphite. Here's just a graphite pencil. I can measure the resistance of this. Okay, just two probe measurement, and I get about, it's fluctuating a little, about 15 kilo ohms. You guys see that? 15 K, K ohms, I guess <laughs> it's kilo ohms. Okay, so I get tens of kilo ohms for my graphite. It's something in between. So most of the time when I want to measure the conductivity of materials, I have to have a certain material. If I want something that's low conductance, I'll take copper. If I want something that's intermediate, I'll take graphite. If I want high conductance, if I, I'm sorry, if I want high conductance, I'll take copper, right? Low resistance. If I want low conductance, I'll take wood. If I want something intermediate, I might take graphite, right? It's very rare to have a material that you can actually tune the conducting properties. And that's true for nanotubes, right? As I said, I can have a nanotube that just depending on how I roll it, in one material can either be a metal or a semiconductor, right? And have different metallic properties in one material just by tuning it different ways. And that's a pretty, that's pretty interesting and, and very, very useful, as you'll find out. So I have all the different structural properties, but now tunability in its conductance as well. Now, the, the drawback is, so statistically, I get two-thirds of nanotubes are semiconducting and about one-third metallic. Now, the big drawback is that it's really hard to control this ratio. So it's really great to have it, but people haven't yet figured out how to actually control whether you get metallic or semiconducting tubes. You usually just get a mix. So that's been a big drive um, among researchers, is trying to figure out how to separate semiconducting and metallic tubes. But it's still, you know, there, there's some ways of doing it. It's very useful to have both types of, uh, of conduction in nanotubes. Now, why do we want to have these small things? Well, as I mentioned before, you, want to, you might want to, as things shrink down, right, as we start getting smaller and smaller iPods and, and cell phones, right, um, we need smaller and smaller electronic circuits. And so nanotubes have, there's a big motivation for using nanotubes in nanoelectronic circuits. Okay, here's just an artist's rendition of nanotubes making a circuit, right? And here's an actual false color image of a nanotube. There's a nanotube in red, and the yellow things are contacting it. This is a little, two-terminal nanotube circuit, right? So the advantages of this is that they're very, very small, right? They can carry a lot of current, right? They have very, very good conduction in both metallic and semiconducting tubes, and they're structurally sound, okay? The disadvantage is that they're still hard to place 
hard to control their properties, hard to connect to other materials. Again, because they're so small and because there's only limited ways of making these things, um, it's hard to really control them well. But it's still worth studying because there's a lot of advantages to making things smaller. And probably a lot of you have seen Moore's Law, which shows that the number of transistors on a chip is increasing exponentially with time, which means the size of the transistors is getting smaller and smaller with time. Right? So right now, we're at the size of the smallest pentium is about 65 nanometers. Right? If you just wanted to make a line as small as you could, it would be 10 nanometers, and yet nanotubes are just one nanometer in diameter, and you can make them very short. So there's a lot of motivation for using things like nanotubes in, 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 uh, in circuits just to stay on Moore's Law, which some people think is really underpinning our economy. If we fall off, everything will just go to pot. Right? So, so you, wanna, <laughs> well, you don't want to test it, though, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> who wants to be there when it happens? I don't know. You know? So, um, so, so it, it's, there's a big motivation to, to actually look at these small, small electronic circuits. And also, there's this a lot of basic physics questions. You know, what happens when we shrink things down? Right? You may know what happens to bulk. Right? If, I take, if I take this piece of copper and I measure its conductance, you might think you know what happens to it. It just has some resistance. It sort of you know, does things you expect. Right? That's sort of a bulk thing. Now, if I take an atom, an individual atom, you might know what to expect there. You expect some sort of weird physics, wave and particle duality, and quantized energy level spacing. Right? But what if I now take something in between, something that's sort of small enough that you can see quantum phenomena, but big enough that you can still see bulk properties? Right? Now I can sort of extend between what I expect from atoms and what I expect from bulk properties and really see how we get from individual atoms all the way up to the bulk. Okay? There's a lot of physics in between here. So there's a big physics motivation for studying this area. Okay, I'll finish up soon. I just want to mention, you know, I, we talked a lot about studying nanotubes, making them. I just want to say very briefly how we make a nanotube device. What do we physically do to contact these things, right? This is one of the hardest things with studying small structures. You can't just put two leads on them, right? I really, I'd really love to take a nanotube and just put a probe on it, but as you know, at a nanometer in diameter, it's just not going to work, right? How do I actually get to these things to study them, right? Well, first I have to grow the tubes. I mentioned before that nanotubes need high temperatures and carbon to grow. I can do that by just sparking between carbon sources. That's not so controllable. It's much more common these days to use what we call, it's much more common to use what we call chemical vapor deposition, where you just put a little chip, a chip inside an oven. You can see I put catalyst. I pattern some iron on my chip. I put it inside an oven. I flow some carbon gas across it. In this case, I flow methane. Okay. And I use a recipe. It's sort of like cooking. I, I, I put, I put uh, something like, I don't know, a uh, thousand cubic centimeters of methane per minute flowing for 15 minutes at 900 degrees, and I get nanotubes on my surface. Okay? It's, it's basically a recipe, but it's a really cool recipe because you take this thing out of the oven, and you just get nanotubes. You can see this growing. Here's my catalyst, and these things are my tubes growing on my chip. And this can be, this is scalable. This is how nanotubes are made by the bucket full these days. People, instead of putting chips in, just let nanotubes precipitate out and just collect them at the end. They put in, a, a, they put in a, a, a gaseous form of catalyst, a gaseous form of carbon, and they just get buckets of nanotubes at the end. So it's a very scalable, useful method. I then need to find these tubes. Again, I can't look under a microscope. These things are, are smaller than the wavelength of light. Okay, they're smaller than the wavelength of light. I can't just look at them. I need some specialized way of imaging them. Um, well, one way that this is done is by instead of using light, you can use electrons, and electrons scatter, hit the surface, and reflect off. You can, re you can make your image that way. Um, a, more, a different way of doing it is using what we call an atomic force microscope, where I take a very sharp tip. This tip has a little bit of attraction to the surface, called a van der Waals, a little electrostatic attraction to the surface, and that amount of attraction depends on how close it is to the surface. So as I scan the tip around, it'll move up and down very slightly, depending on how attracted it is to the surface. This tip is on a little cantilever. So it goes down and up, depending on how attracted it is to the surface. And you can measure very, very small height differences this way. And then I figure out the height of my tip just using a laser to figure out how much it moves as it goes across, and then reconstruct my image from a photo detector, and I get something like this. Okay, so I'm not looking at this optically, but looking at very small forces using what we call atomic force microscope, and I can get an image of my nanotubes that are on the nanometer light length scale. So here's my iron, and here's my nanotubes on my surface. Okay, 
I then what, use what's called lithography. I won't, I won't go into this in detail. It's just use a photosensitive material that you can develop and then put metal onto to make little metallic patterns. And if I use a photosensitive material, it's optical lithography. That's what's used in the semiconductor industry. If I use an electron-sensitive material, I can use electron beams to expose, get very small feature sizes. And here you can see I put metal on my nanotube. Here's a nanotube, and here's a metal contact on it. And I just make bigger, bigger and bigger metal contacts to my tube until eventually I get to this huge size of something like half a millimeter that I can actually put stuff, leads on. Okay, so here's a real nanotube device just sitting on a chip. I've used an atomic force microscope to find my tubes. I've used lithography to make contacts at bigger and bigger si length scales until I can make big contacts. I can just sort of glue on leads, right, and measure my nanotubes. Okay. And when I measure them, I'm just measuring it like I did here, right? I mean, basically, all I really want to do is take, you know, imagine this is my nanotube. I just want to put two leads across it and measure its conductance. That's all I really want to do. I just had to go through a lot of rigor mold to get there because they're so small, right? But basically, I'm just doing that. I'm taking my nanotube, putting a voltage across it, measuring its current, right? It acts like a resistor in a circuit. Okay. So if I have my nanotube here as a resistor, right, I just put a battery across it or some, current, some voltage source, measure the current, my nanotube with some leads, okay? Just put a voltage across, measure the current. I also sometimes have a capacitively coupled gate that can change the energies of the tube. And when I measure the conductance in this way, what do I see? I see this. Here's conductance versus this electrostatically coupled gate. And you can see I get low conductance for some region, and then suddenly it turns on. Okay, this is a transistor. Just a simple nanotube with a gate acts like a field effect transistor, right? And the transistor, you want something that has, that's a switch, right? It has low conductance, you get high conductance by turning it on, and the simplest nanotube already acts like a transistor, but a tiny one, right? This is a one micron length, one nanometer diameter transistor. And it turns out that it can have even bigger on conductances than things like silicon already at low, at low switching voltages. So again, why do I care about things like, like transistors? Well, obviously they're used in, in things like radios. I actually won't show that, but transistors are used in all of your you know, all of your circuits, all of your computers, all of your radios, everything has transistors, right? And in fact, people have already used nanotube transistors in things like a nanotube transistor radio, where all of the radio elements, from the antenna to the amplifiers, the headphones, are all made of nanotubes. You can't see them here, but this is about a millimeter length chip, and it's inside here in tiny little regions. These are, these are the amplifiers, the antenna, and all those things, all made of nanotubes. Okay. This is just a demo circuit board showing how it works, but uh, you can hear this is a radio broadcast made using a nanotube First radio. Between Park Heights and Falls, the weather and again, between York the traffic and report. Valley, according to another driver, and we do have some heavy traffic out along the bottom end of the JFX from an earlier crash we had up around the North Avenue off. So this is a nanotube radio. Okay, that, what you just listened to was a, was a traffic broadcast from a radio made of all nanotube transistors. Okay? So instead of having a big transistor radio, several centimeters, you now have a transistor radio. It has all the transistors that are just nanometers in, in size, okay? nanometers and, and hundreds of nanometers, tiny, tiny radio. Ramp, a lot of slow traffic. Okay. And there's also just many open fundamental questions in physics, things like, you know, how do we expand our knowledge of physics in one dimension? What's the quantum behavior we expect from from nanotube, from, from small particles. Can we see wave particle effects? Can we see single electron charging? I'm going to skip some of this. I was going to talk more about that, but I will, uh, I will just mention one little thing, which is that one of the things you can see when you measure nanotubes is, is you can see them act as particles in a box, right? Some of you may know from quantum mechanics, you may not know that, that atomic particles show wave particle duality, right? You, if, you confine, if you confine them if you can find them in a box, in a small enough box, you can see a wavelength associated with them. And you also see that they can't take any energy. They have to have certain quantized energy levels, right? They can only have certain energies. So that if you, if you put a particle in a box and you measured the conductance of the particle through the box, it could only have certain energies, not, not any have, you know, conductance like you measure here that scales with length, but rather it has quantum energy levels. And if you measure conductance, you can see the energy you can see that the conductance has a peak when you have one energy, then you get no conductance, and a peak at another energy, 
and each of these peaks corresponds to a single electron going in and out of your box. In this case, if I take my box is my nanotube, okay, my nanotube is just my box connected to leads, I can measure conductance through there, I see these peaks which show single electrons going on and off a nanotube, okay. It's a single electron, it's a single electron transistor, and I see particle in a box effects. So again, if I just make, measure things like nanotubes at relatively low temperatures, where I can make it into a box just by barriers between the leads, I can see quantum mechanical effects. Okay, and this is the sort of thing that I've been studying, these sort of quantum mechanical effects can be seen just from having the very, very small length scales of nanotubes. Okay. And I won't go on more about this except to say very briefly that if you scale up these particles in a box, you can get to things that look like quantum computers where you can get multiply, you can get massively parallel processing in a quantum computer just by scaling up particles in a box that interact with each other. And I won't mention this. Okay, but here's an example. I'll just show you what it looks like. A nanotube quantum computer might look like this, where this is the nanotube, okay? And then you have different particles in a box defined along the tube to get quantum computing, which is just using quantum bits instead of classical bits to do computation, which is, uh, which is massively parallel processing, as I mentioned. Okay. So just to conclude a few of the things I've, I've talked about today, I, I, I've, I've sort of, I've talked up nanotubes as much as I can, just because I think they're really cool and really great. Um, I've been a little bit, um, a little bit uh, quiet about the many drawbacks of these things, right? There's a reason you haven't seen them all over the place so far. And again, the biggest drawback is just that you really, it's still hard to control their properties, their electronic properties. It's still somewhat hard to control their position and direction, and it's still hard to contact them because they're so small. So this is the direction that a lot of engineers and, and physicists are working these days, or many scientists, are trying to get this better control of different nanotube properties to make them very useful for different applications. And in general, I think just if I give a status report on these, I'd say that we're still limited by some of the, our inability to fully control nanotubes and all their properties. But there are a lot of very promising initial results, right? Um, a lot of the technologies use various aspects of tubes, right? They use their electrical properties and their structural properties and optical properties, right? They're, they're very unique, and you can use the combination of the unique properties of tubes to make unique devices. And I think that's very, very promising um, in terms of just thinking about what you can make in the future, right? Um, you can extend the techniques into different sorts of chemicals, different sorts of drugs, different sorts of comp composites. There are already some, appli some commercial applications. You can buy devices made with nanotubes. Um, but it's still a little bit early to tell how many devices we'll get in the future just because there's, you know, we have to worry about market forces, you know, outside our control. Things like, you know, how competitive these are in terms of effectiveness, price, reliability. Okay, so that's a little, that's what's, I think, limiting. That's, I think that's part of the reason why you don't see so many applications now of tubes. But if there's a market out there, right, I think there's a lot of things that you can make and a lot of unique things you can make using nanotubes. Okay. So in conclusion, I talked about the nanotube synthesis, uh, the properties, the science, the applications of them. They said some applications are really ready for commercial use, like the sensors and the composites, right? There's almost, you know, you can possibly use these in a very widespread way, almost certainly in niche uses. Um, there are other applications, like quantum computers, that require some big advances, but could really be revolutionary. And there's a lot of research going on in these areas. And in general, this research into nanotubes, both their technology and their basic science, is really, is really, you know, is really, uh, it's ongoing. It's still a very fertile area for both applications and for, and for basic science. And like I said, I think they're really also just a highlight of nanotechnology in that a lot of what I talked about today can be extended to other nanotech molecules like DNA or little balls or something. So a lot of this um, is, a lot of what you think about nanotubes can be extended to other molecules, um, but nanotubes themselves are very unique and offer a lot of, a lot of possibilities. And I'll just lead you with, uh, with my graph of what the possible things of, possible applications and uses of nanotubes are. So thanks very much for your attention. It's been fun spending time with you.